the closest the world has ever come to a nuclear war, occurred in the fall of 1962. The Cuban Missile Crisis was an ultimate exercise in conflict and compromise, with the overall fate of the world hanging in the balance. In the early 1960s, the global situation was ripe for an American and Soviet conflict. In 1962, the United States deployed 15 nuclear-tipped Jupiter missiles in Turkey, right on the doorstep of the Soviet Union. This created a clear and visible threat to the Soviet Union. On the other side of the world, the U.S. relationship with Cuba was at a historic low. Castro had assumed power in 1959 as a result of a successful coup. Up to that time, Cuba had been a prime location for U.S. businesses and tourism. In 1960, Castro seized $1 billion in U.S. business interests. In response, the U.S. imposed a trade embargo and funded several assassination attempts. What are you doing at the top of Angus? <clears throat> well, it seems it seems to be some sort of a job that has to be done in Cuba, and the United States cannot take an active part in it. We might say we're more or less spearheading that drive to uh, rid Cuba of communism. A little bit too close to our shores. You're not backed by CIA or any organization, are you? Well, I might have heard rumors to that effect, but nobody can prove it. In April of 1961, the U.S. government funded a group of Cuban exiles to invade Cuba and kill Castro. The invasion at the Bay of Pigs proved to be spectacularly unsuccessful. Castro was able to deflect the invasion, and he became receptive to deploying Soviet missiles in Cuba. Seeing an opportunity to shift the balance of power, Soviet Premier Khrushchev decided to launch a bold plan to deploy nuclear missiles in Cuba. In doing so, Castro would be protected against invasion, and the Soviet strategic position would be significantly enhanced. The mission was called Anadir, after a cold Siberian city. Khrushchev knew that the operation had to be carried out in complete secrecy. 85 cargo ships were used to carry 40 nuclear missiles, 4 elite combat units, surface the air missiles, and bombers to Cuba. The crew was issued cold weather gear to enhance the deception, and no one was told the destination to well out the sea. The United States military first detected the Soviet shift movement in August of 1962. CIA Director John McCone dictated a memo to the President indicating that he believed that medium-ranged ballistic missiles were headed for Cuba. President Kennedy holds a meeting with the National Security Council to discuss the military buildup in Cuba. It is clear that Kennedy suspects the Soviet Union of supplying offensive weapons to Cuba. The military would begin to prepare several scenarios for airstrikes and invasion, referred to as op lands 312, 314, and 316. Attorney General Robert Kennedy meets with Soviet Ambassador Anatoly Dobrynin. Dobrynin has not been informed of the plan to deploy nuclear missiles in Cuba, and he tells Kennedy that no offensive weapons are being placed in Cuba. It was clear that part of Khrushchev's deception was to keep Dobrynin in the dark. The first evidence of medium-range ballistic missile sites in Cuba is found in photographs taken during a U-2 surveillance flight piloted by Major Richard Heiser. The National Photographic Lab identified components of SS-4 medium-range ballistic missiles, 24 surface-to-air missiles, and IL-28 bombers. President Kennedy calls a meeting of 14 advisors later to be known as the Executive Committee. The photographic evidence is reviewed and it is determined that the missiles are not yet operational but could be ready within two weeks. The Executive Committee is initially biased toward military action. What they do not know is Khrushchev has supplied the Cubans with tactical short-range weapons called frogs that could be used against an invasion. An SS-5 intermediate-range ballistic missile site is detected in Cuba. The SS-5 had a range of 2,200 miles, making it capable of reaching all major population centers in the United States. This created a view of an escalating threat to the United States and heightened the urgency to take action. A plan for a military blockade is reviewed by President Kennedy. The action would be called a quarantine to avoid the implication of a military action that might provoke a military response. Military intelligence indicates the first missile could be launched within eight hours. It is realized that low-level photographs would be required to convince the world of the missiles in Cuba. A low-level surveillance flight produces undeniable evidence of the missile sites. In the evening, President Kennedy addressed the nation. Fellow citizens, this government, as promised, 
has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. The quarantine goes into effect. Adelaide Stevenson addressed the UN Security Council with the photographic evidence on covered easels behind him. He would then show the evidence to the world. Do you, Ambassador Zoran, deny that the USSR has placed and is placing medium and intermediate range missiles and sites in Cuba? Yes or no? <laughs> You will have your answer in due course. I'm prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over, if that's your decision. The U.S. military goes to defense condition two for the first time in history. Sixteen of the 19 Soviet ships turn around and head back toward the Soviet Union. However, Soviet subs are spotted escorting remaining ships. It will be learned later that they were equipped with nuclear torpedoes that were, and there was no strong chain of command. The commanders could fire at any point if they felt threatened. The situation was completely unstable and the smallest action could provoke a nuclear war. President Kennedy realizes that the quarantine will not itself remove the missiles from Cuba. This would be recognized as one of the most dangerous times in the crisis. Premier Khrushchev sent a long and emotional letter to President Kennedy, and a back channel is established through ABC correspondent and Alexander Fomin. U.S. concerns about the leadership breakdown in the Soviet Union are prevalent. A second letter arrives from Premier Khrushchev calling for the missiles to be removed from Turkey. This message is different from the message from Alexander Fulman. The hostility escalates as a U-2 is shot down by Soviet forces under the authority of the local commander. Robert Kennedy meets with Anatoly Dobrynin at the Justice Department. He would indicate that if the nuclear bases were not removed by the next day, the U.S. would remove them. Dobrynin raises the issue of the missiles in Turkey and Kennedy indicates that there would be no quid pro quo. He did indicate that President Kennedy considered the missiles obsolete and had ordered them dismantled recently. Premier Khrushchev broadcasts on Soviet radio that the Soviet Union would dismantle the missile sites in Cuba. The crisis is essentially over. The Cuban Missile Crisis was the most harrowing case of global conflict and compromise in history. The conflict could have easily set off a nuclear war as the only nuclear response available was complete retaliation. The Soviet Union lacked command and control to ensure the weapons were not launched by the lower ranks. Finally, the U.S. misjudged the effect of its nuclear buildup on the Soviet Union, a conflict and compromise the world hopefully never sees again. <laughs>